a little bit unsure how to get started with your CNC machine and where to begin, well keep watching. Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of James Dean Designs. If you're new to the channel Love Lies or CNC work, make sure you hit that little subscribe button in the corner to get all the latest tips, tricks, tutorials and reviews. Now in today's episode we are going to be going through setting your very first job up on your machine and what to do on the computer to get it all working. And the reason for this is I've just finished my Carveco Makers Beginners Guide and that covers everything up to exporting your very first file and this video is now what to do with that file and get everything up and running. So we're going to start by taking a look at material on your bed, different ways to hold it down, and ultimately the method that I prefer to use most of the time. We're then gonna move on to the computer, take a very quick look at how to install your CNC machine, if you've not done that already, then move into our control software, which is ultimately where we make everything work and get the job up and running to output to the CNC machine. Now, if you are familiar with certain stages of this, obviously, feel free to use the scroll bar to skip to the sections you want to catch up on, or use the links in the description area below to jump to relevant points. But for now, let's take a look at material on the bed and different ways to hold it down. So for the purpose of today, I'm demonstrating this on one of my larger machines, purely because it is easier to film. But the same principles we're gonna to cover today apply to large machines and small machines, such as 3018s. Now, the first thing I look to do is secure my material down. And the reason I do this first before installing any bits into the router or spindle is because ultimately you're gonna be moving your hands about trying to hold this down or clamp it down. If there is a sharp CNC bit in the router and it's close to your material, there's always a chance you're going to catch it and ultimately cut your hands and you don't want to get blood on your material i did this very early on one of those um small thin 20 degree v bits went straight through the edge of my finger and was a clean cut and took it off so learn from my mistakes put your material on first and then sort the bit out later now when it comes to holding our material down there are various options that we can look at one is clamps and I'm going to run through some of those shortly. The next is blue tape and CA glue. I'm going to show you a demonstration of that again shortly. And there are other methods such as screwing it straight down to the spoil boards to be honest or what are called cam clamp systems. And these are where you have pressure coming in from the sides to hold the material down as opposed to pushing it down from on top. Now to keep this basic I'm going to look at the most two common methods today which is clamping the material down and as I say the blue tape and CA a glue method. Now when it comes to clamps there are a few variations out there. On smaller machines like 3018 and 3020s you may get little ones that look like this. When you start to get to bigger machines the clamps obviously grow in size as well in relation to them. Some have knobs on top to help you clamp things down and then there are ones like this with an extra crank on the um, on the metal itself. Now out of all of these these are probably my least favorite because trying to spin the wing nut over this um, cranked part can be a little bit Bit difficult and it will often slip one side or the other. So I'm going to take these out of the way now anyway just so we can talk about the other types of clamps. Now all of these do exactly the same job and have exactly the same purpose. The principle is to apply downward pressure holding your material into the bed. Now I'm being very specific about that downward pressure because what I often see is people applying these clamps wrong. For example instead of the clamp holding it down or even being parallel to the material they will often have the clamp facing up like that. Now the difficulty with this is the pressure is being applied sideways as opposed to vertically. So the clamp is actually pushing the material away from itself. At least when it is parallel or pushing slightly down, it is holding it to the bed and therefore it is going to be much more secure. So do remember that if anybody tries to tell you these clamps are no good, I can promise you it is because they are using them wrong and chances are they are installing them on a slant like that but I've never had a job fail using these types of clamps when they have been installed correctly. So if I move these two out of the way, and just quickly explain how they work. Now often you have a slot in the middle and you have a threaded hole on the end and people are never quite sure which way it works. Well the hole at the back is about leveling up the clamp. So put the bolt in there and you can usually have the flathead on the bottom. It can help just obviously give it more surface grip and then the bolt with the wing nut or the knobs on that will go through the bit with the hole and that allows you to apply the pressure down or upwards as needed. Now one possible downside to these type of 
clamps is they can be limited on their height. If I just quickly show you this now. So we'll see that this is pretty much at the maximum extent that the clamp will work. Now how you have a fairly thick spoil board and then we've got some 18 millimeter pine on top. If I quickly slide this in, now what we can actually see is even though this is at the, the maximum allowance that the bolt will allow, it's not quite deep enough to get the material. If I move things about, I can probably try and get it in one way or another, but ultimately it is a little bit tight. So I'm quite limited with these in terms of the thickness of the material I can put in place. Now, an alternative option to allow these to um, clamp deeper material is to use longer bolts and this will obviously the length and the bolts will give you more depth in terms of what you can actually clamp but do pay attention i've made a mistake with these in the past make sure that they are clear of your router whenever you start a job we'll see this got a little bend in here ultimately the router hit this bent the clamp away and therefore obviously you know it kind of ruined and stopped the material being held down as well so if you do decide to use longer bolts ultimately once you've got your material clamped there down, just check that nothing hits those. And that is ultimately one of the downsides to clamping your material is that no matter where a clamp goes, whether it's in the corner, in the middle, there is an area of the material that you can't machine because you've got to avoid those clamps. Now, this is where the blue tape and CA method glue comes in or even double-sided tape. So let's move the camera over and I'll show you that now. So what is blue tape and CA? Well, blue tape is exactly what it is called. It is a blue tape, also known as painter's tape and sometimes a bit like a masking tape. Ultimately, you can apply something to the surface and it shouldn't really soak through to the layer underneath. CA glue is also known as super glue and it is basically a type of glue that you can apply use an activator and it will set extremely fast now in my videos I use Starbond there is a link in the description area but there's lots of other brands out there available for this and ultimately its main selling point is simply that it will set within seconds so how do we apply this if we move this out of the way and I'll quickly show you here. So you apply a layer of blue tape to your material. You apply a layer of blue tape to your bed. Now the amount of tape is obviously dependent on the size of the material. You may try and cover the whole area. You may space them out. You may even just put a single line of tape on. Next, you would take the glue and you would apply a layer to that tape. You then take the activator, spray that on the opposite side and push them together apply a little bit of pressure and within seconds they are held in position. Now the great benefit to this method is so one, it is fast, two, it can technically apply pressure all over holding the material down. But most importantly, there are no clamps around the piece of material. So you can literally go edge to edge without worrying about knocking something or breaking a clamp. And that is ultimately why this is probably my favorite method for holding things down. Now I said a second ago, you can also do this with double-sided tape. Yes, you can. The reason I prefer blue tape is generally because it removes easier from the bed. Double-sided tape can sometimes leave a residue. With this type of stuff, when you're ready to move the piece, you see Simply just peel up a corner or get something like a scraper underneath and it will literally pop off all as one. And also, providing you've used enough blue tape and CA glue, obviously you can cut straight through this material and all of the bits in the middle are going to hold in place. You don't need anything like tabs because the material, as I say, should remain in place. Now, the only thing you have to be careful with when using blue tape and CA glue is if you've got a fairly chopped up bed like I'm starting to get over here. I don't know if the camera will pick that up. But obviously, the more cuts you have going in your spoil board, the less area there is going to be for the blue tape to stick to. So basically, if your bed starts to get chopped up, just be wary of using blue tape because say it may not stick correctly where you've got big chunks missing out of your bed. So to complete the job we're doing today, I am going to hold this down using blue tape and CA glue. But if you don't have that to hand, I'm gonna just talk for a few more seconds about the clamps themselves. Now the first thing you need to try and do is gauge where you're cutting within your material. Now usually obviously it's going to be in the center area so you can apply your clamps to the corners. The minimum amount of clamps you will need on any one piece is obviously going to be two, usually one at either side or top and bottom. But ultimately, the more even you can apply pressure around the material, the better result you are going to get. Now in this scenario here, my job starts in the bottom left hand corner so I've deliberately not put a clamp there. 
But one thing you need to take into consideration is if this is being held down with pressure in all four corners, then chances are there is going to be a slight discrepancy in the height here. We are probably talking at tenths or hundredths of a millimetre, so it is going to be tiny. But say just one thing to take into consideration. If your job starts in the bottom left corner like this or any other corner, you maybe want to try and apply another clamp somewhere close to the corner, but not quite on it. So in this scenario here, I could have perhaps put another one to the side here or maybe be at the front here to try and even out the pressure. Now the other thing I will just point out, earlier on I said about your clamps being parallel or pointing down. Now if we look at the angle of these, technically the majority of the clamp is pointing upwards, which is a bad thing, but because of the cramped piece on the end, the actual pressure is being applied downwards, which is exactly what we want. So even though there is an upward slant, the final piece is pointing down and going to put the maximum pressure on the material to hold it in place. And then ultimately, this is nice and secure in place should we want to start the job. But for now, I'm going to quickly remove these and then hold this down with blue tape and CA glue. Another quick thing to mention is when you are applying the tape, make sure there are no creases in it. Obviously, if there's a crease somewhere, it's going to adjust the height of the material. So make sure your tape is perfectly flat on both surfaces. So we left it a few seconds. This is now solid in place and not going anywhere. So let's get the bit installed. Now for today's video, we are using a 1 8 2 flute upcut end mill bit. These are fairly standard with a lot of your smaller machines. Now, obviously, DeWalt's and Makita routers, they're all quarter inch, whereas this is a 1 8 inch bit. So we need a converter to make this a little bit wider. And we're gonna use one of these sleeves. The bit simply slides into the sleeve and it then makes it a quarter inch in diameter to fit within this collet. Now, whether you're installing it into a quarter inch bit or a normal spindle with a 1 8 inch holder, a few things to remember. You want to make sure that the bit sits inside the collet at least one third of the length of the bit itself. And generally speaking, the deeper you can go, the better it's going to be as it minimizes any wobble within it. But you don't want to come down too low that you're actually interfering with the flutes on the bits themselves because the flutes ultimately excavate the material out the way. So you need to make sure they are completely clear. So I'm gonna slide this into the collet sleeve by about one third. And then I'm going to insert that sleeve inside of the router itself and just slide it in there and it should stay in place for a second while I grab the spanners. Now for a router like this, you will have a locking button on the side. So rotate it around until it starts to grab that little button and you'll feel it lock in place and tighten it up by hand as much as possible. Obviously being careful not to catch the bit itself. And then obviously you'll have a spanner just to pinch it up and make sure it is tight. There we are. Now, if you have a normal router with an ER11 collet, you'll have a set of spanners like this, and ultimately you do the same thing. You use one spanner to hold it in place and the other spanner to tighten the nut up and make sure that bit is secure and in place. So your material's held down. We've got the bit in place. It's now time to jump over to the PC and start to get this set up ready to run the job. So we're about to move on to the PC, but I just want to say the next segment of the video is a general overview of doing this. It is not specific for any particular machine. So do just bear that in mind. If you're after specifics for a 3018, a 4040, a 4030, then check out my other setup videos. But this, as I say, is an overarching view to get everything set up and get going. The software we're going to be using is called UGS. This is one of multiple control softwares, and I'll talk about this a little bit more into the video. Now at this point, if you have already installed your machine, then skip ahead to the part where we start using the control software. But if you are completely new to this and you haven't yet set it up on your machine, then we're gonna walk through the very basic steps just to install your driver and make sure everything is working correctly. Now chances are with your machine, you will have had a USB stick or a thumb drive. So start by connecting that to your machine and opening the folder up. You'll usually see a set of files that look something like this, the key one we want to start with is the driver. So we're going to go into that folder and you'll see a file that looks like this. Now, before we open this up, do make sure that your machine is connected via the USB cable. You will need that to be connected for this driver to install correctly. And when I open this up, there will be a security message pop up on your screen. Just simply click yes and go to the next stage. You won't see it pop up in this video. Once you click yes, it will take you through to this window and simply click install. Wait a few seconds until the successful message has displayed. 
So there we have install success. If yours doesn't install, then chances are you may have a faulty file. You can use Google to search for the relevant driver for your machine and you'll be able to download a fresh one. But we're gonna click OK now and we're gonna close this down. The next thing we're going to do is just check that our machine has installed correctly and is connected. We'll do this by clicking on the Windows menu and start to type device manager. You'll see this option for device manager, open that up. And you want to scroll down to the option that says ports expand this menu out and what you should be able to see is something that looks like this usb serial ch340 obviously looks very similar to the name that was just on our driver now the important thing we need to know is the number that is next to this driver com4 yours may be different yours may be three four five six it doesn't matter if it is different to mine just make a note of that number we will need it very shortly now the next thing we need to do is use our control software to ultimately run the CNC machine. Now I'm just going to go back up one level in this particular USB drive. We can see we've got a few different options. GRBL control, also known as Candle. This is a very common piece of software that often comes free with CNC machines but it is one of many options you can use. We also have UGS. UGS is my favorite piece of software to use. And there is another popular one called Open Builds Controller. There are many out there. The thing I should stress is ultimately they all do the same thing just with some slightly different functions between them. So don't get overwhelmed by that. It was the same, my favorite is UGS and I already have this installed. If you don't have it installed, you can either head over to Google, type UGS controller, and it will be one of the first options that come up and you can head to the download page and download the latest version of it. Select your relevant machine. You will notice there are different versions available. These software often gets updated, so it will give you the latest version and the previous version, just in case there are a few bugs. And it is the same with Open Builds Control. If you get search for that, again, you'll find the download link quite easy. I'll minimize this back down for now. If you are doing it from a USB stick, you can head into the folder, unzip these files, and ultimately get it installed and ready to use. I'll quickly just open this zip folder up for a second. The reason I've done this is I just want to show you something. If we go into this folder, now people often don't know where the UGS file is. Head into the bin folder and you will see these EXE files. It will be one of these depending on whether your machine is 64-bit or 32-bit. If you are in doubt, just click the one that has no number at the end of it and this should open UGS for you. I'll close this down. Just go back up one level and it's a similar thing with candle you can head into the folder and find the candle exe file now say for the purpose of today's video i'm doing this in ugs because that is my preferred platform now i already have ugs installed so i'm going to click and open it now chances are when you are opening UGS for the first time it may look a little different than the way mine is laid out. And one thing I should stress is that they are all the same piece of software just the different builds they move things about slightly differently. And ultimately every panel in here is customizable so you can drag on the um, bars in the middle, resize things up or down, you can drag the bottom ones and again go up and down. Not quite sure that button hasn't rejigged on the side there. And anything with a tab on can be pulled out, placed in a different window and moved around. So you really can customize this to get on screen exactly what you want. Now there are a couple of key things we need to have open. The toolbox, the jog controller, the visualizer, and also the console box as well as the controller state box. Now most of these will open up by default. There is one missing which is for the Z probe and I'll show you how to open that now. If we go up to window and we'll come down and we can start to see all of these options. All the different tabs that are available will be in here somewhere just in the different pop out menu. So as we can see the jog controller is just below this menu and under plugins we can see jog controller. So if you are missing any, you can simply turn them on and off from this window. Now the tab I need is the probe module for the Z probe, so I'm going to turn that on now. And one last thing I'll point out, if you ever want to reset the view, again, go up to window and click reset windows, and it will put things back to how it originally was. 
Now the next thing we need to do is connect the machine to the computer. At this stage, make sure your machine is turned on. We're going to come to the bar on the top and this allows us to connect to our machine. We're going to leave GRBL selected. Now if you remember a few minutes ago, we looked at the COM port number and mine was COM4. So this is what we're going to select from the drop down menu. If you don't have any options in here, click the refresh button and then select the relevant COM port that you need. So again, I'll just select COM4. And for the board rate, usually by default, this is going to be 115200. If you're struggling to connect and have a different number in here, chances are this is why. So make sure it is set to 115200. So with all that done, we can click the connect button and it should connect to our machine. Now, if your machine has limit switches, chances are when it connects, it's going to look something like this and you'll have an alarm status. This is perfectly normal. The first thing we want to do is get rid of this alarm code by simply clicking unlock. Now, once you've clicked unlock, everything should come to life and we can see we've got access to all the different jog controls here. And I would simply start by just putting a small measurement such as 20 millimeters and making sure everything moves around as expected. Just test the different directions and make sure everything is moving as it should do. Now at this point, if your machine has limit switches, you may want to home the machine. Homing ultimately gives the machine a fixed reference point that it can track coordinates from. If you don't have limit switches, don't worry, but I'm quickly going to run the homing process now. Now what I should have pointed out a few seconds ago, if you have some numbers down here in the controller state panel. Now the two numbers represent different things. The larger number represents the coordinates in relation to the job you are working on. And we'll see those change shortly. The bottom ones is in relation to your machine itself. Now we just homed this machine, which takes it to the furthest corner and then it bounces it back off by three millimeters. So basically it took it to the, fur the furthest corner, reset these to zero and bounced it back off three millimeters. That's why we can see that all pretty much spot on three millimeters. Now these coordinates can be very useful in a few minutes, which I'll show you shortly. What I'm simply going to do now is jog the machine all the way back to the material and get it as close to this bottom left hand corner as I possibly can. So what I did there was jog the machine all the way back to this bottom corner. And what you're aiming for is the corner of the material to be in the center of the bit. Now obviously with something like a 1 8 bit, this can be quite difficult to get it as centered as possible. But a one possible way is use the rotation of the flutes to try and judge it. So when you're judging the front to back on the Y axis, turn it round so that the straight line of the flutes is going that way. And obviously when you're trying to do it on the X axis, turn it round so the straight line of the flutes is going that way and you can get it as close to that corner as possible. You may have also seen quickly on screen, as I got it closer to the position I needed, I reduced the step sizes down in this box here. The step sizes are basically how far it travels each time you click one of these buttons and the feed rate is at the speed it will do it and you have separate controls for the X and Y and the Z axis. Now once you have your bit in position on the corner of the material, what we're going to do is come up to these buttons at the top in the toolbox and click reset zero. Now you'll have seen on the visualizer things jumped a little bit about and it has now pinpointed this as the corner of our material for which it is working in. But we know the X and Y is set, but we haven't set the height of the Z. I roughly did this by eye, but we want to get it as accurate as possible. So how do we do that? Well, we can either use the paper method. This is where you put a piece of paper on the material. You lower the bit down until it starts to touch that paper. And as you keep pulling the paper back, slowly lower it down a bit further until it starts to grip the piece of paper. Once it is gripping that piece of paper, you know it is close enough to the top of the material. A lot of people use this, but the most accurate method is to use a Z probe. A Z probe is faster, it is more repeatable, and will give you more accuracy. Now, if you've not set a Z probe up before, there is a link in the corner which runs through every step of setting this up. For now, I'm just going to quickly change the thickness of my probe plate. The Z probe on this machine is 20.1 millimeters, so I'm going to enter that in. Next, I'm just going to jog the spindle more into the material so I can place the Z probe on. So we're going to take it about 20 millimeters diagonally in and I'm also going to raise it up about 25 millimeters 
and I place the Z probe underneath and connect the crocodile clip to the bit. I'm then going to initiate the probe. Remove the probe out of the way. And what we have now just accurately done is set the height of the Z axis. So we did the X and Y earlier, but now with the Z axis set, we can click return to zero and it should come back to this bottom left hand corner and perfectly sit on top of the material. Now what we can see with these numbers down here is we have zero, zero, zero. This is the start of the job. But the smaller coordinates below are the reference points from the home position. Now the reason this is extremely important is should your job stop or stall halfway through and you want to return to the exact same starting point, these smaller coordinates are the ones that you need to know. So at this point in your job, make a note of these smaller coordinates, either take a photograph of your screen, write them down, because they are very useful to return to this exact starting position. So that is the basics of setting the machine up. The last thing really we need to do is load in the job that we're about to start. So we're going to come up to the open box, navigate to a file and open what we want to get cut today. Now a few things to note in the visualizer when this opens up. First is the measurements around the side. This will give you an indication of the area the CNC is expecting to move about in. So we've got just over 185 millimeters in the width on the X axis and nearly 76 millimeters on the Y axis. And we can see over here, we have a depth of 26 millimeters or 26.2. And we'll see a lot of lines on screen. The blue lines are the cutting lines, the yellow lines are the travel lines, where it will be going in between each cut. And we'll also now see this gray cylinder. The gray cylinder is the reference point for where we run the Z probe. So it is useful to know in case you need to run the Z probe again, as I say, in case your job may be stalled, or you need to recheck the height. You can see the same position that you did it previously. Also on the visualizer, this is a 3D environment, so you can rotate and move things around by clicking and dragging with the mouse. And you can start to see the type of depth we are going to be cutting through, and you can zoom in and out by using the scroll wheel on the mouse. A point, and if you were unsure on the visualizer, this little yellow cone is the indication that this is where your spindle is sitting. Do is to get this job started. So we're going to come to the toolbar at the top, click send and get this job on its way. And once the job has complete, it will return back to the home position. So what we'll do now is move this out of the way. And that's your first job done really. Now using an upcut bit in some pine, we're gonna get a bit of fray around the edge. We can clean that up with a bit of sandpaper. But we're gonna come in now with a scraper, just pop that underneath and start to slowly prise this up. And it should all come free. We might just be able to see that it has cut all the way through. If I push that through and clear out some of the sawdust out of the way. We can see the little tabs through there, if we tilt that up, just coming through. So we'll take this away now. We'll cut those tabs, that's probably a better view. Cut those tabs out and this piece should then just pop out. So all I've simply done is given this a light sand over the surface just to take off any fray. The cut on it was fairly clean. You can obviously run the sandpaper around the edges to take off any sharp areas, but ultimately, that job is done and has come out very clean. So you've set everything up on your CNC machine, you've set everything up on the PC, and hopefully you've got your very first job machined out. Now, if you did hit issues, don't worry, it does get easier the more you get into it, and it kind of comes like, like second nature, getting everything in place and ready to go. And ultimately, the more you do it, the faster you will become at it. That is everything for today's episode, and I really hope you've enjoyed it and found it useful. If you did, please like it, please give it a thumbs up and also make sure you subscribe to the channel as well. Thank you all very much for watching. Final thanks as always goes to my patrons. If you want to get involved for early access to videos, one-to-one -one help, that type of thing, then check out the patron links in the description area below. I will see you all on the next episode.